So, I'm going to make a, a salt cellar tonight. Uh, start to pass this one around. I uh, started making these a few years ago. One of my wife's friends had a request. Her husband's been an amateur chef, and um, he bought a whole bunch of salts from like all over the world. Um, Himalayan, pink Himalayan sea salt, this black smoke salt, some sort of Hawaiian salt, Mediterranean salt, and all that. He yeah, wants to know what goes in what, and it, each one has a unique flavor. So he wanted a bunch of little salt cellars. Um, for those who don't know what a salt cellar is, a salt cellar sits next to your stove, open it up, a little pinch of salt, throw it in, close it back up. So you don't have to deal with a grinder or you know, just a regular salt shaker. Because you know, fancy salts, they come in you know, usually uh, a larger grain than your standard you know, table salt. Um, so he wanted the way to to differentiate the different salts. Um, as it happened, I was already kind of working out the process to make these. And one of the things I think is really cool about this is you can actually see, well, a little bit unique about this is you can actually see this is a, a little brass pin, and that's what it pivots on. But on this side, there's also a little black dot. In this case, it's a little piece of ebony. Um, and that does a couple of things. It indicates where the box opens at, so there's no question about that. Um, for my wife's friend, he had four different salts, so each one of them got a little bit different color. So, you know, one got ebony, one got holly, which is white, uh, one got uh, red heart or bloodwood or something, which is red, and then one got a little uh, dyed, stabilized, uh, dyed green box elder pearl, a little pin blank cutoff. So he was able to identify which one of his salts was which without needing to um, it also has, I don't know if you can kind of hear it or see it, it has a little magnetic catch. So there's a lot kind of going on. It's a pretty simple piece. It's a pretty simple form. But we'll talk about some of the challenges I had and how I was uh, able to overcome them a little bit. So I'm going to uh, use some uh, poplar tonight. Uh, my preference would be cherry. Um, I went to uh, Al Harwood the other day, and they had some a four inch thick cherry, which is really, really nice and really, really expensive. Um, and it was my lunch hour, and I didn't want to wait for them to take the time to do, you know, they'll, they'll do a cutoff off a longer piece, and they didn't have any short pieces for me to buy. And I didn't want to wait for that, so I went with Poplar. They had a piece that was uh, pretty small, um, fairly inexpensive. Um, but I do like that it's, you know, it's, it's nice and thick. This is 16 quarter. That means it starts off four inches thick. Um, they do, you know, some planing and some other stuff, and it's it's not quite four inches thick by the time they get finished with it, put on the put it on the sales floor, but that's all right. Um, you could do them with not quite as thick. I do like to, to do them pretty large. They're also left thick and heavy, because you, you want them to sit on, you know, a, a countertop or next to the stove or whatever. If it was light, it, you know, you run the risk of being tipped over and also a nice wide base just reduces the risk of actually having you know problems and having them tip over and spill your nice expensive salt uh, on the floor. So um, this is mounted um, in a bowl grain orientation. I do them uh, <laughs> excuse me I do them bowl grain so the grain is running uh, perpendicular to the lathe. Um, as such uh, I will not be using a spindle roughing gouge as it's not a spindle. Um, so the majority of the turning will be done with a bowl gouge. Um, so I've got it mounted between centers. I always rotate the piece by hand um, to make sure that we have clearance. I'm going to take off my wedding ring and my watch. Put them in my pocket. Um, I obviously don't have long hair. Um, I don't have any jewelry. I don't have long sleeves. Um, nothing hanging down. Even the, the microphone cord is run up through my shirt. Um, so there's no risk of anything you know, really getting caught. Always rotate the piece by hand anytime you move the, uh, the tool rest. It's just a, a safety thing. Lathe speed all the way down. Turn the lathe on and then you can start to turn it up. If I was out in my shop last night turning a pen at 3200 RPM and I come back in the morning and I put a 12 inch platter blank on there and turn the lathe on at 3200 RPM, there's going to be problems. So always a good idea, feed down, lathe on, then you can turn the lathe up to, uh, to speed. So I'm just going to rough this out, this 
and attach it to a two cylinder, a sparkler. It's a sparkler screen stop. It doesn't take the best test. Is that all right? So it should be pretty close to a cylinder there. This piece did start out about five inches square. And we are fully round. Um, the one that's being passed around, that started out as a four by four by four cube. Um, I think it's a little bit on the small side. Uh, that's why I did go a little bit larger, five inches in diameter. Probably won't use the full, um, you know, four inch thickness, but I do like that, that option. Uh, the next step, and I did this at home already, so I'm going to swap out the blank here, is, and this is kind of the, the first trick, is I drill the holes first. So once the piece is round, I've taken a, a pen and I've marked out about a, a circle about three-eighths of an inch in from the largest diameter. I then did a, a line across through the center and I've drilled two holes. I've drilled an eighth inch hole here, that's going to be for the pivot, and I've drilled a quarter inch hole here. That's going to be for the magnets and it's also going to be for the little dot that we're going to turn that's going to fill that hole. So those are going to show through, but that's the easiest way I figured out to be able to make sure that everything lines back up, the grain lines up, everything lines up when the, the piece goes back together once you're finished. You know, it does necessitate turning that little, you know, the little ebony plug and you'll see the, the little brass pin on the top. I don't mind that. You know, the, the way that I kind of do these and, you know, the way I describe my, my wife's friend, it's a feature, not a defect. You know, it's, it's a feature, not a defect. What hardware? Uh, the magnets I got off the web. Um, I, can pass, I can pass some of those around. They're a uh, quarter inch diameter. They're one, I think they're one sixteenth of an inch thick. Little rare earth magnets. Good kit. Um, and then the, uh, the other piece that I'll pass around is the brass stock. Um, if you look on the one that's being passed around, there's actually two pieces to that. There's a brass pin, and then on the body, there's also a little brass tube. So I'm using an eighth inch brass pin, and I'm using a 5 32nd inch brass tube. That's the other half of the pivot. Um, both of those I got at Ace Hardware. Um, the magnets, I looked all over the place. I looked on Amazon, I looked everywhere. Amazon, it was really tough to find, you know, the exact size and thickness that I wanted. Uh, they're a little bit thicker, and I've used those before. These were probably about a quarter of the cost of what Woodcraft was. I think a hundred of these was like twelve dollars. Um, no, I, I don't remember. I, I can find the information if somebody wants to know. Uh, but I, I got them off somewhere off the web, um, ordered them, I had them in three or four days. Um, like I said, 10, 12 bucks for 80 or 100 of them. So they're, they're, they're pretty darn cheap. Um, so I've taken the time, I've, I've drilled this. Um, I did it on the drill press. Just so I had a nice drill in. Pretty deep, because it, it needs to go all the way through the lid and into the body. And I'm going to turn a tenon on each end. I'm going to part it, part the lid off. So I've probably gone in, you know, an inch and a half or so. I don't want to go in too deep because if you do any kind of profiling on the outside of the box, you run the risk of, of turning, you know, into that, that drill hole. And that would, we don't want to do that. Good question. All right. So we'll put this back on the lathe and now I'm going to part the top of this off. So I'm going to put pinnons on both ends actually. So 
you can kind of think of it like I'm making a lidded box. I don't have to have a huge pattern, it doesn't have to be very deep, especially on the lid. Ten on that end, you'll do a ten on real quick on this end as well. I'm going to use dovetail jaws, so I do want to have a little bit of a dovetail on that tenon. I'm going to clean that up very quickly with a little spindle gouge. The shape of the tenon is important, the size is important, it's got to fit inside the jaws. But I think more important than the diameter and the shape of the tenon, I also want these shoulders here to be absolutely flat, as flat as I can get them. That's really where your, your holding uh, um, strength comes from. It's not from gripping the tenon, it's from having those flats. If, the, if those flats were angled, it's a lot easier to lever the piece out of place. If they're flat, um, you're much more likely to, or much less likely to, uh, to take the piece out. So I'm going to part the lid off of this. I'm probably going to part about right there. Leave about a, a half inch, five eighths of an inch or so. So this will be the lid. This will be the body. Make a little relief cut just so I don't bind. I did turn the lathe speed down a little bit for this. down about as far as I dare. Now I've got to show my new toy. So this looks like a regular utility knife, right? It's actually a little Japanese pulse saw. So now I can get in there. A little bit easier with a little bit smaller diameter piece. This is a little bit big for this, but it's a pretty cool little toy. That one did come from Amazon. Is that a purchase or you made it? That is a purchase, and I tell you, I really like it. And it was ten bucks shipped from Japan via Amazon. It took about three weeks to get here. So I'm going to be a little bit patient, but uh, 10 bucks, I mean, it's ridiculous. 10 bucks shipped from Japan. And it is made in Japan, too. It's not, a, it's not Chinese. It's come through Japan. It is actually from Japan. So I'm going to put a chuck on the lathe now. I'm going to do the lid. First, I like to do the lid first. What am I looking for? I need my key. You explain the jaws on there? Quite different. They're. Uh, they're Nova 70 or 75 millimeter jaws. I really like them. They, they hold a lot of different stuff. They, they fit you know, right in between the 50 millimeter standard jaws and the 100 millimeter, millimeter the power grip jaws. So I really like them. So this surface here, this is the inside of the box. This is the underside of the lid. 
So I'm going to face this off, clean it off, and then I'm going to turn a little bit of a recess inside of there. We're going to put the chuck in and expand into that recess, and that will allow us to, to turn the top of the box. So the next step is to face this off. this outer surface, this is our contacting surface. This is where the, the two halves of the box are going to come together. I want that to be nice and flat. That little pip in the middle doesn't matter. That's going to go away in just a second because now I'm going to hollow this out just a little bit and put a recess in there. And that's how we're going to check this to be able to turn the top. I'm going to go with the parting tool just to give myself a little more of a square edge in there to tuck into. And then just to pretty it up, I'm just going to it's just a very slight chamfer on that edge, so it's not quite as obvious of how I'm reverse chucking this. At this point, I would sand and finish this surface. This is the last time we'll have access to this surface. And now we can take this off and we can change out the chucks and we'll use expansion mode on a different chuck to be able to expand into that and finish off the top. Before I do that though, I want to turn my little dot. So I want to have the dot in place and then turn the top surface so that dot is flush with the, the top of that, uh, the top of the, the box, the top, top of the salt cell. So I need to turn this down to a quarter inch. I don't need very much, just a little tiny, tiny dot. Probably a cutoff from a cutoff from a cutoff. You can see there's not very much material left here, but you don't need a whole lot. So just a tiny bit smaller. One of the goals for doing this, ideally when I'm done with this, I shouldn't need to use any glue. Everything should just be a, a press fit. I have a little bit of glue if I need some, but ideally no glue should be necessary for this. Yeah. Using a parting tool to get a little bit of a truer cylinder. Looks like I'm still a little <clears throat> bit tapered there. It is a little bit tapered. I, I usually do taper it a little bit, get it to start to go on, and then straighten out that taper. Okay, so there we're, we're on. Now I'll just take and part that off. Yeah. 
we've got to keep track of that. All right, so we're done with the ebony. We don't need to keep track of it long because it can go in the lid now. All right, so there's our dot. At the same time, we can put in your shot. There, I got it. All right, so we'll keep track of that too. So I just cut a little length of the brass pin at home last night. Again, that just gets tapped into place. And now we can expand into our recess and we can finish the top of our salt cell. So now I'm just expanding into that. And we can finish this off. I just kind of dome off the, the top of this. I don't worry about it you know, having too much shape or anything. Throw my tenon goes away completely. I'm done with it. I might need to go a little bit deeper with my, my dot there. I've started to turn into my dot already. I'm nowhere near turning into my pin. So I just need to drive the dot a little bit deeper into that pin. So we'll do a little more turning on this. Lower my tourist just a little bit. You guys can hear it, but I can hear a little bit of difference in the sound when I get to the ebony. I will definitely hear a little bit different sound when we get to the brass. Tiny bit more. I kind of like the that little recess that we've got on the top, I think I might leave that. So just a few more very light cuts here. I do want to get all the way down to the brass. If the brass were still below the surface, it would be a defect, it wouldn't be a feature. And it looks like I didn't push my ebony in quite deep enough Okay, that one. Right there. So I'm down to my my brass. I did go all the way through the ebony. I'm not going to replace it. You guys saw me do that once. 
Um, I would sand and finish the top of the lid at this point as well as the largest diameter. One last thing I do like to do with these very carefully is I will put a little bit of a camphor. That's where the top and the body of the salt cellar are going to go together. I don't like to have those completely flat. I do like to make a little bit of a chamfer there just so there is that actual little, you know, it it's, ends up being kind of a little bit of a V groove, half on the lid and half on the body. Helps hide any little inconsistencies, which is nice. Remember, we were in expansion mode. So we'll pass that around. Ebony dock went away. We can easily replace the ebony dock and return it. Uh, we can always rechuck it on that ex expansion point on the inside. We may do that. We're, we're going to have time. All right, and now for the body. So I'll switch over to a slightly larger chuck. Bob, you were interested in those jaws. I'm sorry? You were interested in those jaws. Uh, I took a video of them earlier. But it's, uh, it's almost like an eight-jaw chuck. Well, the screw the hole's in the middle of the jaws. The space so. in between them. Yeah. I really, really like them. They're probably my second or third most used jaws out of all that I have. What's the reason you like them? They're in between size. Okay, so it's the size um, more than the actual. What's that? I, they're either 70s or 75s. I can't remember which. Yeah, they used to only come in a four jot set, but now you can buy them separately. So I, I like them because they're an in between size. You know, if I make the 10 in a little bit too big for the 50s, but too small for the 100s, there's my 70s. Um, I also like them because they have, it's almost like eight small jobs rather than four big ones. Yeah, yeah, so I, I really like that. All right, so I'm going to face off this top surface. Um, one other thing I'm going to do real quickly while I have the time is the, the tube. That's the other half of the brass swivel is 530 seconds. The hole I have drilled in here is one eighth. So I'm just going to take a 5 30 seconds drill and just eyeball this and just enlarge that hole for the, the, the two half of my pivot. Then we'll do a little bit of hollowing. There I'm faced off. While I'm thinking about it, I'm going to do that little chamfer on this half as well. That just improves the look of the two halves when they come together. And now I just need to hollow this out. Now this is in side grain orientation. You can see the grain running through there. So it's just like hollowing a bowl. It's just a, a little, it's a little bowl. That's really all it is. What's that? Ever drill the, the inside out? No, I'm a turner. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's easier for me to drill it or to, to turn it out than it would be to to go find the you know two inch Forstner bit and get the Jacobs chuck set up in the tailstock and there's not much wood here. There really isn't. So no, I, I just turn it. <clears throat> the only time I really drill anything is, is like a hollow form. Um, bowls I never drill. You know, you'll see a lot of guys on YouTube or wherever. They'll take you know a drill bit and they'll they'll drill to you know three quarters of an inch from the bottom. And when they get to that point, they know they're done. What if I change my mind halfway through, and I don't want to go that deep? Or what if I you know 
find a defect in the wood that I can't go that deep. Something prevents me from being able to go, I've already established that depth, I can't put that wood back in. Unless you use a plug or something else like we're doing for the lid. So no, I, I just, I almost never drill. So I do like this to have kind of a, a nice hemispherical shape inside of here. And as I mentioned earlier, for stability and use, I'm going to use this thick. You know, it's going to have thick walls, it's going to have a thick bottom, it's going to have a nice wide base. And I would sand and finish the inside at this point. I could take this a little bit, a little bit wider. I could go a little bit deeper. Ideally, I would want to have the reveal on the outside of the magnet and the outside of the pivot the same as the, the reveal on the inside. So these two distances would be exactly the same. Just aesthetically, that's what I like, um, but it's, it's not necessary. So we'll call the, the top of this good. I'm going to go in just, I'm going to square up that entrance a little bit. I want the first little bit of this to be straight in and then curved. It's just going to be easier for reverse chucking. Um, if this were me at home in my own shop, the next step would be a vacuum chuck. I would vacuum chuck this to reverse it. Um, I don't. I didn't bring my vacuum chuck. I don't have the proper adapter to fit on this lathe. <coughs> so we're going to go with a jam chuck. I hope that one's too small. So we'll get this one. So this jam chuck is just a piece of, uh, you guys are going to kill me, people. This jam chuck is a piece of rosewood. <laughs> well, it's, it's sisu, it's Indian rosewood. Um, they grow it as a landscape tree in Phoenix. They grow it in parking lots. You know, it's, it's a shade tree. So it's what I had, so it's what I used. You know, like in Phoenix, we burn mesquite for firewood. Like you guys burn, you know, ash and oak and cherry and maple. I've got it. I've, I've still got a little bit left, and, it, and I know some people. I've got a guy. All right, so I'm going to turn just a jam fit on this so that my body goes onto it. I'm very disorganized tonight. <clears throat> um, for those who maybe noticed but were afraid to ask, um, this piece has been drilled and tapped to fit on this spindle on this lathe. Um, so I can put it on and off and it, it's, it really goes back to the exact right center pretty much every time. So a little bit smaller still. Put a taper on that, just a tiny bit of a taper. Check the fit just starting to go.
All right. Now the real question is, can I get it back off when we're done? So we'll bring the tailstock up for safety. And we'll do a little bit of profiling on the outside and we'll finish the bottom. Last thing we'll have to do is install the magnets. And I do have a tip for that. Anybody want to guess what the tip for the magnets is? Yeah, don't don't put one in. Yeah, don't put the two north poles together. Don't put the two south poles together. You know how I know that? Do you know how to get them apart? <laughs> When I did that, I just pushed the one a little bit further in and put another one in on top of it, facing the right direction. Good adjustment. Put a little bit of profiling on this, just to wear a plain cylinder. I don't want to get all the way up to this diameter, because this diameter is the same diameter as the lid. And I do want those to end up being the same. So just a little bit of profiling on here, just giving it a nice pleasing shape, but still leaving a nice wide bottom. This is a utility piece, I do want it to be stable in the use. And we'll get rid of that pen. Undercut the base a little bit. <coughs> At this point, I would basically sand the outside and as much of the bottom as I can get. <coughs> and if we want to do any decorative, you know, grooves or a little recess or anything, now would be a good time to do it. We'll just throw something on there real quick. And now we'll get rid of the nub in the center. I do want to make sure The only point of contact will be this outer diameter. I want to make sure this is a little bit concave. It doesn't have to be a lot concave, but I do want to make sure it's just a little bit concave underneath there. If it was completely flat, you know, we know that wood moves. If it's completely flat, there's a 50-50 chance the wood goes like this or it goes like this. If it goes like this, it's never going to sit flat. It's always going to rock. So I always make sure there's a little bit of a concave on the bottom of there. So if there is any little bit of wood movement, I'm still sitting on a nice flat surface. All right, can I get the lid back, please? It'll, if you throw it just right, it'll have a matching nice dent. All right, so we'll put in my little brass tube. That's why I drilled out that slightly larger hole. Hit that with a little bit of sandpaper. And now we need to install our magnets. I like to do the body first. This goes right into there. And then I set the magnet on top of it so that I know that it's facing the right direction. All right, let's replace that little ebony button.
now we can turn the top of the lid one more time and we're done. Now you have a good excuse to buy three chucks. <coughs> Why stop at three? <laughs> How many do you have, Bob? That's a very good point. I have three. You have three? Anybody got Bob B? Three? Four. Four? Six. I think I have six. Jason, yeah, one light. Yeah, one light. Yeah, multiple lights, rose engines, and all that doesn't count. There's a button flush, so. so. Now we put it together. Lid pivots nicely. Magnet catch holds it in place, aligns the grain. There's the dent from where we dropped it on the floor. That's a feature? That's where I'll sign it. Right. Yep. So there's a uh, salt cellar with a brass hinge and a magnetic catch.